Hi, this is Steve at PleasantHopeForever.com. We are studying together in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse, and in our last study together, we had begun to look at chapter 5. I was anxious to get to this point, uh, Romans chapter 5. Uh, verse 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's one of my favorite verses. It's always been one of my favorite verses. And one stands soberly before that text, justified by faith. And Yet, how far much of Christianity has moved away from that truth. You would think that it would so grip the heart as it did many years ago. But it doesn't seem uh, to today. The idea today is doctrine's not important. Please, I ask you people to listen to me very carefully. Our ancient brothers and sisters were enough convinced of the truth of justification by faith that they were put to death for that faith by the religious system. So how important is it? We have the blasphemy of such a system. We have the blasphemy of many a preacher. I won't, I won't mention names. One of them saying that the God of the Muslims is the same as the God of Christianity. The faithfulness by which we as Christians, born again Christians are justified is the faithfulness of Jesus Christ and it has nothing to do with a human a what I've often referred to as a human merit-based religious system it has nothing to do with baptism extreme unction or or any other of the blasphemies that are used to blaspheme the finished work of Jesus Christ therefore having been justified by God's faithfulness. We begin to move away from that when we suggest that one is justified by the exercise of his own personal faith, something that, that the individual does, separate from any action of God. We have seen, if you follow these these videos you've seen that in our study that faith is the result of regeneration regeneration is not the result of faith it's just exactly the reverse of what modern thought tends to be the faith that you exercise is inseparably connected to the faithfulness of jesus christ i want you to turn with me for a moment to the seventh chapter of matthew matthew chapter 7, uh, beginning at verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works and I will profess unto them I never knew you it's astounding that even in some Christian circles this text is used to try and convince you that justification by faith is not sufficient that that if there is not works connected with that justification then it is not valid now let's look at these people 
what are they saying? They, they're not heathen. They're not saying that they work for Buddha or Allah or for Confucius. They apparently are not even denying the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Mormons would or the finished work of Christ as Romanism would. In thy name we've prophesied. We've taught your word. In your name. These are people claiming to be Christians and working. And that is exactly what modern Christianity says you ought to do. In order to be justified, redeemed, born again. In fact, Many, many churches today will teach that if there are not works accompanying your redemption, as they call it, then the salvation is, is not valid. The salvation in the sense of redemption. And look at these works. Lord, have we not asked people to put their hands on the, if you don't, you know, it's, it's kind of how I think of it. Have we not asked people to put their hands on the television set or the computer screen and cast out demons? I mean, what is he saying? I never knew you. I never knew you. To begin with, that would devastate Arminian and Romanist philosophy. I never knew you. You were never mine. But Steve, but doesn't he say here that we should do the work of God? What is the work of God? John chapter 6, that we believe on him whom God has sent. Folks, there are more people doing works for Christ than there are people believing in justification by faith, which is where we're at in our text. The further that we get from sincere doctrine in the Word of God, the more popular it becomes. Christians throng to, and, and I'm not trying to be critical, meetings like the Promise Keepers that actually prides itself in the fact that they don't have doctrine uh, doctrine is divisive, they say. Oh, it, it does divide. It divides. It surely does. It is necessary that divisions come so that those who are approved may be made manifest. Oh, Timothy, take heed unto the doctrine, for in so doing thou shalt both deliver thyself and them that hear thee. Save thyself and them that hear thee. Justified by faith. God has nothing against you. Difficult for the human mind to grasp. You know, the mess you make of your life. Yet God holds nothing against you. You don't need a extreme unction. You don't need some intermediary. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And to be sure, you have this treasure in earthen vessels. And the reason that you have it in an earthen vessel, and the, the reason it's in the mess it is, is so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. If you get a chance, I'd like for you to meditate on Galatians chapter 5. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. 
I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. Verse 12. In the, in the context of circumcision, cut off is the word for mutilate. The word means literally means castrate. Those upsetting you, says Paul, I wish they would emasculate themselves. What is the offense of the cross? The offense of the cross is you can do nothing to please God in the flesh. It's Christ and Christ alone. God Almighty who became your kinsman, who died in your place to pay a complete penalty, requires nothing more. And that marvelous truth is surrounded by tremendous blasphemy. Look at Galatians 5, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. And millions of times a week in the Mass, Christ will be re-crucified, and your Bible tells you that he died unto sin once, and only once. And in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. He's not dying again and again and again for your sins as the Lamb of the Old Testament. I believe that it could be said that the Mass is direct testimony that the sacrifice of Christ is insufficient. For a Christian to seek God's forgiveness for sin over and over again is a direct testimony that the sacrifice of Christ is insufficient. The scriptural testimony is that it, it, it is sufficient. Christ died tenaciously hanging on to that testimony. Today, today they cuddle up to all kinds of biblical, what I would call foolishness. I mean, folks, where is our conviction in Christ? Where is our understanding of all that he's done for us? Where is that willingness to die rather than to deny Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. As I talk to Christian after Christian that doesn't have peace, there are more people out there professing Christ than you can possibly imagine yet so few that seem to have peace. As I pointed out in, in my last video, the text declares that we have peace with God, which means there are many who are at war 
with God. And the works of the flesh are at war with God. They are not pleasing to God. The natural man cannot please God. Because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have peace with God. That is by means of, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Marvelous thought. Yet how many Christians live, constantly live under the burden of a sin that's been lifted and they don't know it. who are willing to believe the truth of God's word. For people like Paul and David, but but not for themselves. I mean, that's all that, would, that might be. That might have been true about Paul. That might have been true about David, but that's surely not true about me. I mean, we can talk about David's premeditated murder. And, you know, we have to realize that he was the king. He could do anything that he wanted. And from a human standpoint, what he did made sense until God revealed the horror of it. What must it have been for David to remain king? I mean, we wouldn't do that. We'd kick him out. We'd disown him. We'd impeach him. We'd send him to prison. I mean, we'd do a lot of things. But we would never allow him to continue to be king. But God did. Where is the peace that God has provided that Christians ought to know? I mean, this text is even going to get worse. We glory in tribulations. I, you've got to be kidding. Until you come to realize that it is God who is working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And that the sovereign, majestic God, the God who hung the stars in the heavens, has chosen you for his own and completely provided for us. The problem is that modern Christianity, or, or I should say Christianity down through the years, has always wanted to make it synergistic. If not totally based upon the work of man and partially based on man when biblically biblically it is absolutely none no synergism at all not based upon one single work of man but upon the finished work of christ there's the stumbling bl block folks there's the offense of the cross the very words justified by faith gripped the hearts of early Christians and opened their eyes to how foolish was the addition of all of the works that have been put on by the religious system, primarily Romanism of the day, and heart after heart was freed from that burden, justified by faith justified the word means righteous how righteous were you made God declares that you were made the righteousness of God in Christ and you can't be made more righteous than that it isn't that someday you'll be made righteous someday if you're good enough you are made righteous. You stand before him without spot, without blemish, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. That has got to grip your heart. It ought to grab your thinking. Justified by faith. One of the results of that 
justified by faith is that I have peace with God. God is not at war with me. God has nothing against me. I declare unto you this moment on the basis of this book, on the basis of the word of God, that God has nothing against you. And yet you are surrounded by a system, a religious system, by many systems that would argue against that truth. God has nothing against you. You have peace with God. How? By means of Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's not everyone's Lord. He's our Lord. And he is the basis of that peace. Not your works, not your commitment, not your prayer life, not your church attendance, and not your giving. A tremendous majority. Well, it's overwhelming how much Christian literature and Christian thought and Christian teaching goes into what you ought to do and how little of it goes into what Christ has done. And speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, allow, allow me, if you would, to boast in the absolute certainty of his true value, his true worth, his worth, the right estimation of his value, a loving God who works all things after the counsel of his own will and who has declared that we should study to show ourselves approved workmen that needeth not to be ashamed. Most Christians don't give a hoot about doctrine. A minister sat across from me at a Burger King and, and, and said that he felt his only responsibility was to tell Christians how to live, even though he agreed that the subject of this book was the revelation of Jesus Christ. Folks, I can't tell you how to live. You have the Holy Spirit. Believe me, he'll do a better job than I would. Most of the people who, who tell you how to live, and that's kind of they live for telling you how to live. They do a terrible job with their own lives, but they, they apparently can tell you how to live. It reminds me in many ways of, of our, you know, government experts. I mean, they, they know exactly what the deficit's going to be in 10 years, but they don't know what Wall Street's going to do in 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 two weeks or two months. It's not that I can't or should not tell you how to live. I, I mean, I can do that, just not in the way that you think. It just may not be what you want to hear. I think that you should live according to the truth of this book. That's what I think which has nothing to do with your, your trying to clean up the old man, cr trying to clean up the flesh, which the flesh loves to hear. Ask yourself why the flesh loves to hear that, because it just leads to pride. Or you can then feel like the, the strength that you exercise makes God more pleased with you than this other guy over here more pleased with you than he, than he already is in Christ. I can tell you how to live in the one who gave you life, that the testimony of this book is the person and the work of, of Jesus Christ. And that person and work has you involved. It's not separate from you. The subject of, of heaven is not how much you give or, or how much you pray, but what Christ has done for you. You have peace with God. We have peace with God. Oh, that that peace might grip your heart. 
All of us, we all look forward to that day when we step foot on the shores of glory. But even now, even now, our lives are hidden with Christ in God. God isn't fighting you. God isn't torturing you. God isn't taking pleasure in your difficulty. If, if I didn't know God and if I didn't know the, the Word of God, I wouldn't want anything to do with Christianity. I wouldn't want anything to do with it at all. I see Christians in terrible condition. I mean, we're, we're the children of a king. Every one of you ought to have more money than you can spend. Every one of you should, should never have a day of sickness or trouble or argument or, or pain. Come on. Would be the greatest number of spoiled brats the world's ever seen. We not only have a heavenly father, we have a loving heavenly father. Not a single thing has ever touched your life. It wasn't filtered through his loving hand. Is it good for you? If it isn't, it didn't touch you. You are the center of his, the center of his grace and his love. He's not just dealing with the Pauls and the Davids and the Abrahams, but he's dealing with you. You were in the mind of God before he created the heavens and the earth. You were his child long before you ever knew you were his child. You were his child. And he's built a hedge about you so that not one single thing touches your life that, that is, is not meant for your ultimate good. And, the, and as well as the good of those who are intimately connected with your life as well. God's not fighting you. He is working in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. And we can rest in that peace. Can't God do with his own as he pleases? And the answer must be a resounding yes. I'm glad I'm his own. And I'm, I'm glad that he is working in me to will and to do of his good pleasure. Before we go much further, I want you to look at the second verse for, for something that doesn't appear to be obvious, but should be, should be obvious. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. It's basically where we're at here at this point in our study. Let me ask you a simple question. How do you get into that grace? Now, the normal answer is by faith. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. But wait a minute. That, that isn't what it said. And, and the King James Version, is, 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 it's not a bad translation of the Greek. By means of whom we have access into this grace is the access by your faith or by Jesus Christ, by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. That's the question. How many times have you, have you been told that you don't have access because of some sin in your life? Your access to God is not based on whether or not you've confessed all of your sins. Your access to God is not, it's not based on whether or not you're a, a good Christian. 
on whether or not you're living a faithful life. Your access to God is based upon the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. That's what your access is based upon. That's the grand truth of that second verse. It isn't a, an access that we work for. That's my point. It isn't an access that we purchase, that we buy. It isn't an access that we deserve. It's an access by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. You know, like a like a vault that's just stacked to the ceiling with gold bars. You know, you, you couldn't spend it all. It's there. The gold's there, you know. No matter how much you need, it's right there. It's an inexhaustible supply of gold. Our access into the grace of God is by the faithfulness of Christ. We have access. It's there. Christians have taken that and said, now, if we want access into this grace, then we've got to do something. We've got to be faithful. And if you're not living faithfully well, then you don't have any access into that. That's great. So now we've got good Christians, and we've got, well, not so good Christians, and maybe some really, really bad Christians. You know, some of these... Some of these are great Christians and some of these are poor Christians. And folks, that is an easy trap to fall into. And many have fallen into that trap. There's not a Christian, a child of God, that God doesn't call a saint. So now all of a sudden where there are layers or variations in the righteousness of God, well, you've been made very, very righteous. And well, me, I, I've been made a little bit righteous. And, and then, you know, this guy over here, well, you know, or, you know, there are some of you who haven't been made righteous hardly at all. Are, are you kidding me? And, and that's what we do. That's what Christians do. That's how Christians think. That's how the natural mind thinks. Access to God's grace by personal faith. And, and if you don't exercise it, you don't have much access. That is not true. That text says that your access into the grace of God is based upon the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And it, it is in that where you stand. If you had some little known uh, aunt or uncle who died and, and left you a million bucks, well, you've got a million bucks. If, if you don't know about it, well, you still got a million bucks. You don't spend it. You're not enjoying it, but you, you've got a million bucks. You've got a million dollars. I actually knew a I knew I knew a man here in my small town, never owned a car in his whole life, from the time he was born to the time he died. He never left the county, LaFleur County, Oklahoma. He lived in a dilapidated old house, didn't seem to have anything. And when he died, they found shoe boxes of hundred dollar bills stashed away in the home. And he lived like a beggar. That may not be a good illustration since I'm sure he knew he had the money. But my point is, is that he didn't live like it. Reminds me of the prisoner in the cell where the, the jailer opens the door to the cell. He's free, but he doesn't realize he's free. He's been emancipated, and so he sits there. You do have access into the grace of God by the faithfulness of Christ. That's true. Whether you realize that, recognize that, and live in the glory of that may be up to you, but the access is not up to you. The reality is not up to you, and the grace is not up to you. And God's grace is inexhaustible. Inexhaustible. I don't believe that there's been a sermon preached that fathoms the depths of the grace of God. I know I, I, I've never preached any type sermon as that. And that's where you are. 
You don't face judgment. Oh, you'll face an accounting for what you've done in Christ. But no judgment for sin. When you stand before God at that accounting tribunal, you'll stand clothed in the righteousness of God because of the finished work of Christ. Your appeal is not, is not to the Virgin Mary or some saint or some other intermediary. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we stand, we stand in that grace. That's where we stand. I was asked to speak at a, at a Bible conference, and I, it's been some time ago, and I opened every lesson with, we stand before God. And somebody came up to me and they said, you know, you sound very proud. We don't stand before God. We kneel before God. And I said, I stand in the grace of God. Into his grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I look at Paul, Paul's prayer, and his prayer for the Ephesians was that you'd be filled with the knowledge of the hope of the glory of God. We put our hope in, in too many physical things, our investments, our, our future, our job, our, our spouse, our family, but our hope, our hope is in the glory of God. We are only strangers and pilgrims here. Our citizenship is in glory. I eagerly await the day that comes when, when I, I will stand before him clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Before we, I end this part of, of Romans, before we I wrap up verse 2, I, I want us to look at the meaning of the words used here in verse 2 of chapter 5. Again, in speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, allow me, if you would, to boast in the absolute certainty of his true value. I believe that that's what I've been doing. I believe that's what these videos do do. I believe that's what I've done since the beginning of this video. His worth, his value, boasting in that, in the glory of his value. I want you to take note of three words here. Rejoice, hope, and glory. Rejoice, the word literally in the original text means boast. It's from the root neck, that is what holds the head up high, up, upright. Figuratively, it refers to living with God-given confidence. Hope, as many of you know, means guaranteed expectation of what is certain, what is sure. It's not, it's not wishful thinking. It's guaranteed expectation. And glory, the word glory, doxa, means exercising personal opinion which determines value. It's the meaning of the word conveys God's infinite, intrinsic worth. In simple terms, our estimation of God's value, His worth. Therefore, considering the meaning of these three words, I believe that we have every right to say our, and that's plural, our boast, and that's a present tense, our present boast in the absolute certainty of his true value, his worth. Justification by works does not boast in the certainty of God's value, but grace does. And verse three, the next the next three verses would not be possible without the pre preceding first two verses. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience and experience hope, and hope maketh not 
ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. Perseverance is, is the intense form of the word minnow, to abide. Abide in me and I in you, that's the, minnow is the word, it means to abide. Hupo mone, that's, that's the intense form. Our hardships produces that. Which is interesting considering the fact that these words annihilate the credibility of the so-called prosperity movement. Which, which does not produce perseverance. The word ashamed literally means to curse vehemently. Such hope does not bring us to that. And I'm out of time. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I'm just thankful for the opportunity to once again to just take and, and look at your word and to feast upon it. We're, I'm keenly aware of just how little we know. I just ask that you would filter out all the foolishness, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.